collateral between, on the application of United Trade Action Group Limited and another, and Transport for London and another. Yes, Mr Jaffe. Um, my Lords, I, I appear for um, the appellants with uh, Ms Rooney, uh, Mr Matthias, Queen's Counsel, and Mr Streeton um, appear for the respondents. Um, there are some additional documents um, on the bench. Can I just explain what they are? Um, first of all, the A3 document is an enlarged copy of the Equality Impact Assessment that I at least found quite difficult to read in um, smaller printing. Um, that goes in... Um, the second volume of the supplemental book, uh, at page 528. Well, there were some earlier pages, I think, which may correspond to these. Uh, that there are. I, I put I put some A3 size documents in at 531. 530, yes, there are, there are two copies of it, uh, the Equality Impact Assessment and Bundle, for reasons I'm not clear about. One of them has the names of the relevant TFL officers redacted, and one of them doesn't. Oh, I, I, I don't think it matters. They are identical otherwise. Uh, I'm afraid I can't explain why. That one. Um, then, secondly, um, tab 27 of the supplemental bundle, um, there are some additional extracts of the Mayor's Transport Strategy. Um, there were some pages missing. This is the form in which the strategy was um, uh, given to the learned judge below. Um, 57 in mine is back to school 2020. So, tab 27, my Oh, 27, sorry. So is this a complete document? Uh, no, well, the, the complete document is a few hundred pages, yeah, but this is a larger selection of extracts. Right, so this goes in place of? Uh, the whole of tab 27, whole of tab which is just a couple of pages at yep. the moment. Missing bits Without the missing page. bits. Um, now, the court may already have that, uh, but if not, it's in the core volume of tab 17. I've got it in a different... Um, different format. Format, yeah. But it's the same content. The same documents, yes. 16 Monday. May 2020. Yes. yes. And then... Behind it, there's also the 15th of May, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And two more cases. Where should we put those? Um, those are additional cases from my learned friends. I suggest that they go in at the end of the authorities bundle as 24 and 25. Yes. Right, I'm sorry about all the filing, but I think that's done now. Um, yes, my lords, the learned judge did two things. Um, first, quashed um, the general statement of policy and guidance about the changes to the road network um, sought to be introduced by TfL and the mayor as part of their plan to recover from the pandemic last summer. And secondly, the judge quashed the implementation of that plan in Bishopsgate, the A10. Um, what the judge concluded is that both the general statement of policy, the plan and the guidance, and the A10 order, despite being emergency measures directed at reducing the transmission of infection, were so flawed as to be irrational, and in addition to that, breached the legitimate expectations held by taxi drivers and taxi users, 
breached the public sector equality duty and um, failed to take account of relevant considerations. Uh, I'm afraid that the appeal of TfL and the mayor um, is something of a root and branch criticism of the approach taken by the judge. Um, TfL and the mayor respectfully say that the judge took a wrong approach to the case and as a result reached the wrong decision. The basic submission, which I'll seek to develop, is that how to balance risk, benefit, advantage and disadvantage when taking what were emergency public health decisions is a difficult issue and one to which there will often be no single right answers, particularly in the context of traffic management where there are competing priorities to be weighed. You have a number of users all seeking to utilize the scarce resource of road space, complicated further by a pandemic, in which until very recently, each bus could only operate with one third of normal passenger capacity. If buses are delayed, and bearing in mind they have lower capacity anyway, that means longer exposure times <coughs> for people who use the bus, a greater risk of infection, and therefore a greater risk of serious illness and death. And the exposure risk is borne, in particular, by people who are using buses. So people who, at the time, were essential workers, and buses are particularly heavily used by the old and the disabled. So the basic policy of the mayor and TfL was to seek to allocate more road space and more road capacity to cycling, to walking, and also to buses. Now, if you're going to create an attractive environment for cycling, and one in which buses can move freely, that may mean you have to allocate less space to other vehicles. And sometimes, despite the fact that taxis usually get access to bus priority routes, that may also mean limiting access for taxis, where they would interfere with the free passage of buses or a new cycle route. Those are the trade-offs um, which um, TfL had to seek to balance. Um, and of course, at the time that these decisions were taken, one has to put ourselves back in the mind of last summer, so a world in which there were no vaccines, in which reopening was being planned and implemented for summer of last year, but the requirements of social distancing remained in place and needed to remain in place across the transport network. What TfL predicted... So just pausing on that, yes. if I may. Um, one tends to forget, perhaps, quite what the restrictions looked like at a particular given moment. Um, do we have somewhere in the papers um, just a short summary of what the restrictions were at the operative time for this decision-making? Um, what we have is we have a summary by the judge um, as to what the restrictions were on the transport network um, right. in her judgment. That's the best place to look at it. It, it is. And, and what, what the judge said, if I can summarise it, is at the time, um, the strong encouragement from both central government and from TfL was that the public transport network should only be used for essential purposes and that um, if travel did need to be made, um, buses were restricted in capacity to one third of their normal ridership. So for a double decker bus, that's about 30 people. It depends on the model, 30 to 35 people, um, as opposed to almost 100. Um, do, do you have the passage in the judgment? Uh, yes. Or can it be supplied as we go? On? The judgment is in tab 7, and the capacity limits are set out at. Paragraph 25 on page 77. Thank you. Um, so there the judge summarises that use of public transport still, still discouraged social distancing. Mask wearing became compulsory in June of last year. Um, stagger journeys where possible. And then the, um, the limits on um, carrying capacity for buses. Uh, and some overground trains also restricted passenger numbers. Uh, and then at 26, the judge explains that the government announced in July that schools would return in September. Um, there was an increase in private car use from September, and TfL lifted the social distancing restrictions on buses for a limited number of school services only. And paragraphs 17 to 31 headed facts. Um, 
these are not contentions? Not really, no. Thank you. Now, at the time that these decisions were taken, what TfL predicted was that traffic levels on the road would quickly recover as the lockdown restrictions were lifted and that Londoners would be tempted towards what TfL called a car-based recovery. Um, and that was because there were still significant social distancing requirements on the public transport network and people were unwilling to use the public transport network because of concerns about the risk of uh, infection, which is understandable. Uh, but if everybody transferred from public transport to private cars or other motor vehicles, there would be serious congestion. And the burden of that congestion would not fall on people sitting in vehicles, but it would be fall on those who are on the public transport network, in particular to people on buses who would be exposed to greater infection risk through longer journeys and increased crowding as a result. So the policy was to encourage walking and cycling wherever possible, particularly on strategic routes in and out of central London. Now, that policy may well be a good policy or a bad policy, and of course that's not a legal issue, which is before the court. Um, views vary widely amongst Londoners as to whether that was the correct policy to adopt. But what TfL and the Mayor do say is that in reaching a policy, which was a public health policy at its heart, they did first of all need to act quickly. They did potentially need to act without the full evidence base which they would normally seek to acquire for a permanent measure and in less troubled times. They may need to act without any certainty as to the results of their policy. And they may also need to do things that they know perfectly well will have significant adverse effects on some affected groups. And that's because they're seeking to do something bigger, which is to avoid um, large-scale serious illness uh, and potentially death. Um, I think the most efficient way for me to make my submissions is to um, take them slightly out of the order in which they're in, in the skeleton. Um, as the court knows, there is a substantive appeal, and there's also an appeal for the judge's decision on admissibility. Um, substantial chunks of TfL's evidence were excluded by the judge. Um, I think the most sensible thing is for me to make submissions on the substantive appeal first, um, and to do that only by reference to the contemporaneous written documents. And that means that when we come to the question of admissibility, the court will be able to see very quickly the extent to which the witness statement passages which were excluded by the judge are or are not simply supported by and summaries of the contemporaneous material. Um, uh, in addition, um, whilst it would be very interesting for the court to determine the question of admissibility, it's perhaps not of any great wider interest uh, unless the substantive appeal um, has some merit. Um, so what I'll do, if I may, is um, divide my submissions into three parts. Um, first of all, if I may, I'll turn to the decisions which are under challenge, um, the so-called plan and the guidance first, and then the A10 order. Um, secondly, I'll identify the relevant policies which were applicable to the decisions under challenge, and there are four policies. First of all, the overarching Mayor's Transport Strategy, which is the, the statutory policy document relating to transport in London. Um, then the bus lane policy, the cycling quality standards, and the Department for Transport pandemic guidance, which is also statutory guidance. Uh, and then the third topic will be um, the specific grounds. Um, I'll deal, if I may, with rationality first, because the judge's findings on rationality um, do in practice form part of her analysis of all of the other grounds. Um, and then the other grounds, relevant considerations, the public sector equality duty, legitimate expectations. And then finally, with the exclusion of parts of the evidence of uh, Mr. Monk, the TfL witness. So I'll start, if I may, with the decisions under challenge and what the judge referred to as the plan. Um, the, the plan is um, the press release of the 6th of May 2020, um, which uh, the court just got a, a 
better copy of, which is at tab 17 of the core bundle. Um, what this press release does is it summarises um, what the Mayor and TfL were intending to do on the road network in general terms as the first lockdown eased. And the aim was to assist in the economic and social restarting of London's life whilst maintaining social distancing. So there are four bullet points um, at the start of the press release. Transformation of roads to be fast-tracked, space to new cycle lanes, wider pavements to enable social distancing. Landmark locations are going to get temporary bike routes and more space for walking, and the aim was to relieve, reduce pressure on tube and buses. Um, clean, green, sustainable travel to be at the heart of London's recovery, and then a prediction that cycling could increase tenfold and walking fivefold post-lockdown. Then the second paragraph of the substantive text notes that London's public transport capacity could be potentially running at a fifth of pre-crisis levels. Millions of journeys a day will be need to be made by other means. If people switch only a fraction of the journeys to cars, there will be serious problems which are identified. So to pause you again, yes. uh, I'm just wondering, because we haven't got pagination on these replacement documents, whether it's going to be useful now just to put on the page numbers. Yes. Should we start from 391? Yes. <coughs> yeah. So we're number three from there. Yes. My numbering that takes us from 391 to 397 for this yes. little set. Thank you. So then, uh, picking up two thirds of the way down the page, there are three bullet points. There are going to be there's going to be a focus on three key areas: um, a strategic cycling network, and then using temporary materials. That's a temporary arrangement, including new routes aimed at re reducing crowding on underground and on busy bus corridors. Uh, and then two other policies, transformation of local town centres and reducing traffic on residential streets. Then at the bottom of the page, um, one paragraph up, the temporary schemes will be reviewed by TfL and could become permanent. So it's explained they're temporary, but they would be considered for the possibility of permanence in the future. And then there is explanation of what has already been done and what is then going to be done. Then the Mayor of London gives a quote, um, halfway down 392, uh, and I invite the court to um, just read that quote, which summarises the policy aims which uh, the Mayor was clearly setting out. Temporary horizon, just going back to that, yeah. is indicated where? The temporary horizon is indicated in two places. Yep. Um, first of all, on 391, the first bullet point, two thirds of the way down the page, construction of a strategic cycling network using temporary materials. Yes, no, I, when I said the horizon, sorry, I wasn't being precise. Yeah. I mean, the, de the date. The date of implementation, or well, no. I mean, if it, if a scheme is temporary, it must have a 
notional end date. Yeah. Well, um, temporary is explained as uh, being, it must mean temporary for the pandemic. There are. So it's temporary but indefinite. Yeah. Well, there are, well, not in relation to the A10 order. The no, A10, no, no, surely, but yeah. we're looking at the plan at the moment. Yeah, looking at the plan at the moment. Um, there was no specific end date indicated for the plan, presumably because the mayor and TfL didn't know when the pandemic would end no, no. at that point. No, it wasn't like, um, dare I say, at a road map. Um, with stages on the roadmap, as it were. No. It was temporary, but you say understandably indefinite. Yeah. What was clear, we say, is that it was for the purposes of the pandemic. Yeah. And when it came to implementing the policies in the A10 order, um, there were express endpoints, which were identified. Let's say eight, 18 months or the end of restrictions, whichever is the soonest. Whichever is the soonest, yeah. Yes. yes. So um, I think that would have been uh, until last night, next week, um, when the social distancing requirements were due to be lifted. It's no longer going to be next week. Uh, it's going to be a bit later than that. So um, there is provision uh, in the implementing orders for these arrangements to automatically fall by operation of law uh, once the social distancing requirements are no longer necessary. So they are, in that sense, strictly temporary schemes. Uh, and it may well be that they end before the defined end date in January 2022. Thank you. Um, uh, as the judge pointed out, this press release does not expressly deal with the position of taxis. Uh, and indeed, it doesn't expressly deal with any other particular group of road users doesn't deal with private hire vehicles, doesn't deal with vans, doesn't deal with HGV access either. Um, and that is because, for reasons I'll seek to explain, whether and when taxis might be affected by each scheme had to be, under the bus lane policy, analysed case by case. Uh, and I'll come to that policy in a moment, if I may. The second press release is the press release of the 15th of May, uh, and that's the press release at page 394. And that press release was published at the same day as the accompanying guidance, which is the more detailed document setting out the policy. And two things are announced on the 15th of May. Um, first of all, there are three proposals for car-free zones. Uh, and the second thing that's being announced is the resumption of the congestion charge and the ultra-low emission zone charges from the 18th of May. So three days warning are given of the resumption of those charges. Um, for the first few weeks of lockdown, they had been temporarily suspended. So picking it up at the second substantive paragraph on 394, um, Enabling social distancing to happen on the public transport network as lockdown restrictions are eased will require a monumental effort. Public transport only used when absolutely necessary as a large resort. More Londoners must now walk or cycle. Everyone who can work from home must continue to do so for the foreseeable future. More leisure time in local areas. Londoners who can only get to work on rail must now walk or cycle from rail stations rather than use the tube or the bus and the plans will create more space for social distancing when walking or cycling, ensuring that people who have no choice but to return to work in central London can do so as safely as possible. Then there are the proposals. So the fourth substantive paragraph, um, by the second hole punch, some streets will be converted to walking and cycling only, with others restricted to all traffic apart from buses, as part of the Mayor's latest bold street safe measures, and then there are three proposals, so streets between London Bridge and Shoreditch, so that's the Bishopsgate scheme in the east, uh, and it was divided into a Bishopsgate scheme and a London Bridge scheme um, when it was implemented. The Bishopsgate scheme, as we know, that's what this case is about, excludes taxis during the operating hours. The London Bridge scheme does not exclude taxis. Um, then there is Euston to Waterloo. That scheme was not proceeded with uh, for the reasons that we'll see in the documents in a moment. Uh, and the reason it wasn't proceeded with was because of the effect on taxis. Uh, and Old Street and Holborn, also known as the Farringdon Road scheme, that was also not proceeded with. But it was announced as a possibility. Is 
something going on at the Aldwych Junction with Kingsway, even as we speak, but perhaps that's not a feature of the evidence in this case. Yes. Um, then uh, there are references um, to two topics in this press release, contrary to what was said by the judge. First of all, there are references to disabled access, and secondly, there is a reference to taxis. So the reference to disabled access is in that same passage, the fourth paragraph. Access for emergency services and disabled people will be maintained, but deliveries may need to be made outside of congestion charging hours. And then the passage relating to taxis um, is at, trying to cross-reference, Yes, it's the um, next paragraph, the one that starts Waterloo Bridge and London Bridge may be restricted to people walking, cycling and buses only, pavements widened and so on. And then TfL is looking into providing zero emission capable taxis with access to both these bridges and other areas where traffic is restricted. So contrary to the judge's suggestion, and we'll look at the judgment in due course, that disabled access was not being considered at this stage. Uh, that is incorrect, we say, on the face of the press release. And the proper arrangements for taxi access were also being considered. The proposal, and it was only a proposal at that time, was that some taxi access would be facilitated and the taxis that would be allowed in would be the electric ones. So that was the proposal at the time. The electric ones are sort of a minority the figure from these papers of 10,000 out of 35,000. Yes, it's, it's, it's a modest proportion. <coughs> Zero emission capable vehicles electric. Uh, yes, um, the electric taxis um, uh, have a backup petrol engine, so they're described as zero emission capable, so if their battery runs out they can still continue to drive <coughs> and charging up on their petrol engine. Can I ask a, maybe a basic question. What, what is the status of this document that we're now looking at? Uh, the status of this document is it's a press release yeah. of some proposals. I'm afraid it's not much more than that. So we, we've looked so far at two press releases. Yeah. I mean, they're slightly grandly called the plan, um, but what they are is they are some press releases with some proposals of what the mayor and TfL are considering at the time. They, they don't have any legal status as decisions, they're no more than an announcement of generic policy proposals. I think, I think it's fair to say, my lords, that uh, this would be right. My, my learned friend explained these press releases to the learned judge as being the plan. The plan. Yes. The plan is the two, well, the, the judge has made an order quashing the plan. Yes. Um, that, so she's quashed the two press releases. When has a press release been quashed before? I'm, I'm not aware of a press release having been quashed before. Uh, it, it's being said, I, I, I think being fair to the judge, that, mm. uh, and as Mr Matthias puts it, uh, the press release embodies um, a policy, and it is the policy which is being quashed. Mm. But do, is that that's what the other side says? Is that what no, you say? We say that the language of the plan, with a capital P, yeah. uh, is one which... Uh, the mayor and TfL have never agreed with, and that these are general statements of pandemic policy. The detailed statement of policy is set out in the guidance that we're about to come to. Yeah. That's it, that is the, the, the formal policy. These are, these are press releases summarising um, what the, the general direction of travel, uh, and one has to read them as press releases, um, not as formal guidance, still less as a statute. But be that as it may, I, mean, I, 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 I don't want to hinder my learning at all, but I think it's only fair that the um, court understands how this was put to the learned judge. Because at the outset, I addressed the learned judge on the basis that the, the plan and the guidance were essentially one and the same, and they were to be found in the guidance. That proposition was resisted by my learned friend, who asserted, no, there's a plan and there's a guidance, and there's a distinction. Because the plan is the mayor's plan, the guidance is TfL's guidance. And the learned judge was clearly led to understand, so, so, so were we, 
that these press releases were to be understood as the mayor's plan. And then the guidance was issued by TfL as guidance to the implementation of the plan. Now, I'd invite my learned friend to confirm that that is the position. Um, or was the position then? Well, let's not get the temperature turned up too far too early in this hearing. The, the, the judge has made an order quashing the plan. By that, she meant the two press releases, rightly or wrongly, and um, uh, who said to her that the two press releases uh, can be described as the plan with a capital P, doesn't she? Speaking to, my, speaking to myself doesn't seem to me to matter very much. Anyway, the, you, you will be coming shortly to the guidance, and yes. that is a single document about which there can be no doubt. Um, but I, of course, accept that I'm going to have to, uh, if I'm going to get anywhere on, on this appeal, persuade the court um, that the judge's criticisms of the plan, that is the two press releases, were ones which were inappropriate. Um, and so uh, no, no quarrelling with that. And nor does the mayor or TfL resile from anything they said in those two press releases. And if that means that they have made an error of law, they will have to accept the consequences of that. So I, I don't seek to, to go back on them in any way. I'm just saying, simply saying that as press releases, which were accompanied by detailed written guidance, one has to read them in that context. Um, and then just before we turn on to the guidance, um, one final point on the 15th of May um, press release or plan. Um, looking at page 397 in the notes to editors. Um, the eighth bullet point down makes a um, similar point to the 6th of May that the temporary street space schemes will be reviewed by TfL and could become permanent and then transformative walking and cycling corridors and of course one of them is what we're talking about in this appeal are subject to borough approvals and traffic regulation orders. So for what it's worth it was made clear uh, in that press release that the approval of anything that was being announced as a proposal would have to be subject to the full traffic regulation procedure. In the preceding paragraph, we find further details about the street space for London plans, plural, are available here. In, in, in what sense of is the word plans being used there? Is it, is it individual local proposals? Um, that takes you, uh, as I recall, from when this was discussed at first instance to the web page at which street space is dealt with, uh, where the guidance we're about to look at appears, plus various local proposals that were being developed uh, in conjunction with the boroughs uh, were described. Uh, and so one of the schemes that was implemented, I think, before this was even announced was, for example, the initial scheme on Brixton Road, where the road was narrowed and additional lanes were put in uh, because of very heavy pedestrian traffic in that area. So th th that's just an example of one of the schemes that was introduced. Yes. Um, so then we turn, if I may, to the guidance, which is tab 18 of the full bundle. Yes. Um, it's described on the cover page as interim guidance to boroughs, uh, but th there's no quarrel by TfL that uh, this is also guidance to TfL's officers. Um, who are working in conjunction with um, boroughs to identify and deliver schemes. Um, then at page 405, um, halfway down the page, it said this guidance is intended to complement and follow on from the Department for Transport guidance and set the London context for delivery. Uh, we'll come back to that guidance in a moment, if I may. Uh, and then the bottom of the page sets out the mayor's policy and the three bullet points at the bottom of page 405 are in very similar form to as set out in the plan in the press releases. The aim was to provide temporary cycle routes, more space for cycling and social distancing and then the reasons for the policy are set out on page 406. Um, 
ignoring the first paragraph, which is a, a general introduction. It said, second paragraph, as lockdown lifts, demand for travel will increase. This is likely to be phased and incremental, pose a series of challenges, which are then set out. Lower levels of public transport capacity to provide space for social distancing. Travel by car is likely to become more attractive, um, initially when congestion is low, but it may continue if people are anxious. Car-based recovery has risks to safety, public health, economic recovery, the environment, and it contradicts the mayor's transport strategy. Then the conclusion, we, need, we therefore need to urgently reconsider the use of street space to provide safe and appealing spaces to walk and cycle as an alternative to car use in the context of reduced capacity on the public transport network. Suppressing motorised traffic while allowing essential journeys to take place is key to ensuring we manage our road and public transport networks to maximise the ability to keep people moving around safely. Mr Chaffee, you said earlier that something to the effect that this planning couldn't await a perfect bank of evidence. This had never happened before. So is it fair or unfair to say what we see here is uh, anticipating what an estimate of what might develop, the way people's behaviour might respond to a crisis of this kind? Yes, this, this, is, this is a predictive and judgmental strategy. So TfL and the Mayor are using their judgment to try and work out what they think is going to happen on the road network as lockdown lifts and what the consequences will be for public health if they don't intervene. Yeah. And they've identified what they think the consequences are and then they seek at some speed to develop a policy in order to address it as best they see fit. It's a similar task to, of course, what was going on in many areas of national and regional and local government at the same time, which is, here are the problems. And, and the problem that's being addressed here is, is, is not the initial lockdown, in which everyone is told they have to stay in their home unless they have reasonable excuse, but the, the gradual reopening of London's economy and society as people are allowed out again. What are the consequences of that going to be in circumstances where the virus is still circulating? And therefore, social distancing is still required. While we're pausing at that point, um, the guidance is, is um, in its title, interim guidance. Does interim have the same sense there as temporary in the press release that we looked at a little earlier? Um, it's explained at page 405. Yeah. Um, the second paragraph on 405 explains that it's a live document intended to be updated regularly, um, and then initial guidance on knowledge sharing to aid delivery. So uh, I think the intention is that these are our, uh, this is what we have to say initially, but we expect it will have to be updated. Have there in fact been subsequent? They have, yeah. I'm not asking to see them, I just want to know. Yes, they have. There, 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 there's been um, a number of minor iterations and I'm aware there's been one major update to the guidance as well. So if we went online now, which incidentally I haven't done, um, we would see a different document. You would. Uh, and it was updated uh, in, as far as I'm aware, I'll be corrected from behind me if I'm wrong, in the autumn of last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was, it was, there was last a major update in the autumn of last year, um, which uh, introduced further and additional guidance. And, and have those iterations tracked the evolution of restrictions broadly? Yeah. So one thing which happened in September is um, that, uh, as we've just seen from the judgment, um, schools returned. And TfL had to make a number of decisions about how children were going to get to school, because many children go on the bus or train to school. Um, and there was a, a very difficult judgment to be made about whether social distancing could be maintained on school services. And the decision of TfL was that there should be dedicated school services for children only, in which there would not be social distancing, in order that children could be kept off other buses used by older people and social distancing could be maintained on those buses. And so, for example, that's one of the topics which was dealt with. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a public health measure. Um, 
recognising relative risks and advantages and disadvantages. Yes. Well, we don't have to go into no, that. You, you, you said that there have been, there's been a number of tweaks, my word, not yours, and one major update. Could we just have the month of the major update? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get that. Um, I can also get the course a, a, a web link if you, if you fancy reading it. You may not. Not particularly. Thank you. Um, so then page 406 um, expands on the basic policy under the heading the ambition and scale of the street space plan. Uh, it explains why it's necessary to make this reallocation of road space. And um, I do draw the court's attention to the first paragraph under the heading ambition and scale. Um, the second sentence that this plan has been, the, the guidance has been developed in order to help respond to the immediate public health imperatives. And then they're explained in the bullet points. So it's avowedly a public health measure. Then at page 407, the predicted benefits of the plan are set out in the bullet points. Restoring confidence in public transport by providing space for social distancing, prioritising those who need to travel, such as key workers, and those who are unable to travel by alternative modes, for example, those with reduced mobility, economic regeneration, improved health and well-being, and opportunity for Londoners to experience the benefits of reduced car use. So that's the basic statement of the policy in our submission. Um, and then there's more detail on the strategic cycle network at page 418. Uh, and I, I appreciate it's quite not, not the most interesting topic to be going through a guidance document, but this is one of the documents that the judge quashed in its entirety. Um, so page 418 sets out TfL's guidance on the cycle network. The case for intervention is that a network of safe, attractive cycle routes is required to make cycling a viable alternative form of transport. And to achieve the goals of the plan, a usable, coherent, and comprehensive network of cycle routes will need to be provided. And then the key principles are set out at the bottom of 418 in the bullet points. And the aim is to provide that coherent, usable, and comprehensive network without any major gaps. Uh, and the explanation there is it's for Londoners to use during the COVID-19 recovery period, so when people are not locked up in their homes, but when they're getting out and about again. Serving the corridors of highest demand during the recovery period, including routes that parallel crowded underground and bus corridors and routes that provide access to key worker destinations such as hospitals. Uh, and so that's how Bishopsgate came to be included, because it meets those criteria. Then at the top of 419, the cycle routes need to be attractive and safe for everyone to use, including new and less confident cyclists, people using non-standard cycles, uh, then jointly planned with other measures, and also support the requirements of buses and freight during the COVID-19 recovery period reflecting the important role these models will play in London's social and economic recovery. So the requirements of buses and freight are being identified as being particularly important in the policy. Then halfway down 419, there's a heading guidance on the bus network. I'm sorry, Mr Jaffa, can you just explain, you jumped over it, Temporary strategic cycle net. What is an in-flight cycle route project? Uh, in-flight means uh, a cycle route which has been proposed but has not yet been delivered on the street. So uh, an in-flight is something which is currently in progress. It's yeah, bad, bad jargon. It's a wonderful image. <laughs> it, it sounds like it's not going to improve public safety. It's an in-flight cycle route. Three-dimensional yeah. use of road space. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think what's being meant is um, cycle route projects which are in progress will be brought forward using temporary measures. Yeah. Um, uh, um, 
So then the guidance on the bus network, the, the relevant part is the second paragraph under the heading guidance on bus network, government guidelines on traffic management in response to COVID-19 suggest whole route approaches to create corridors for buses, cycles, and access only on key routes into town and city centres could be considered. <coughs> Then there is an assessment uh, in this document of the equality effects of the guidance, and that's at page 430. Just before we leave 419, I should know, but I don't. What's the TNAN notification? Uh, traffic management notification. That is, um, under the um, Traffic Management Act, there is a duty on the boroughs to provide a written notification to TfL before any works are carried out on roads in London, which may affect TfL's road network. So that's, that refers to the procedure for those notifications. Uh, it gives TfL the right to object and to amend um, any borough's proposals under the Greater London Authority Act. Um, so page 430 is the equality analysis. Uh, and it's pointed out that COVID-19 disproportionately affected vulnerable populations, including those living in more deprived areas. And then at the bottom of 430, the street space plan provides safe space for walking and cycling, enables social distancing on public transport for those who need to use it the most, is therefore an essential part of protecting vulnerable Londoners. So again, the public health objects are set out clearly. Then at page 431, at the top of the page, um, walking is explained as being valuable. And then the second paragraph, it is, however, important that any interventions to support walking and cycling are designed holistically to ensure Londoners can move around in safely. And when making changes to street layouts, boroughs are asked to use existing guidance to ensure the changes don't detract from current accessibility levels and enhance them wherever possible. Then the public sector equality duty is set out. And then at the end of this section, just before the, the branding guidance, um, officers should ensure that all impacts on protected characteristics will be considered at every stage of the programme anticipate the consequences on these groups, make sure that any negative consequences are eliminated or minimised, opportunities for promoting equality are maximised, uh, creation of an inclusive environment is one of the key design considerations, uh, and it's expected that the overall effect on equality target groups will be positive. Uh, and that, that's because, at the risk of stating the obvious, the people at the greatest risk of serious illness or death from COVID-19 are people who are disabled or who are older. And so the equality effects of these proposals were expected to be positive because their aim was a public health objective. And who are officers for these purposes? This is guidance going to, what is the range of people who might be required in the course of their office? That there are two broad categories. One of them is officers of boroughs, because many of these schemes were implemented on roads which TfL had no control over, their borough roads. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, a particular local authority uh, might be funded by TfL to carry out a scheme in their own borough. So this guidance is addressed to local authority or borough officers who are implementing a scheme for themselves. So it's providing them with help as to how to do it properly. Uh, but also, of course, some of these schemes, including the Bishopsgate one, were implemented on TfL's roads, the, the major strategic routes in London. And so this was also guidance, which was for TfL's offices as well. So th they're, they're the main audience. Uh, but it, it was published. It's public guidance. Uh, and I do note at page 431, we, we, we just looked at um, the second paragraph, and there is a reference to existing guidance relating to accessibility. So it's made clear in this document, it's not meant to stand alone as an entirely freestanding statement of T 
TfL's policies. Of course, TfL have a number of other policies. Sorry, which particular reference were you pointing uh, to? Sorry, 431, three, four, three, second, yeah. second paragraph. Second paragraph. Boroughs, uh, third line, boroughs are asked to use existing guidance yeah. to ensure these changes don't detract from current accessibility levels yeah. and enhance them where possible. So it, it's not suggested that this is a, a freestanding document. There's not a hyperlink to, to existing guidance. Um, no, there's not. Well, one of the reasons for that, of course, is boroughs will have their own guidance. So we're about to come to the bus lane policy. One of the curious features of London's transport uh, policy is that the bus lane policy is a TfL policy, which is not universally uh, agreed with by all the boroughs. Uh, some boroughs like the bus lane, po bus lane policy, and they implement it themselves on their roads. roads. Uh, some boroughs dislike the bus lane policy and give less priority to taxis on their own roads. Um, such are the joys of um, local government. But, um, so it's in general terms. So those are the policies which are under challenge. Um, the street space guidance mentions and refers to the Department for Transport statutory guidance. Uh, and if I could just show the court that briefly. Um, it's in the supplemental bundle at tab 35, page 366. Um, this is the version that was before the judge, which was dated the 23rd of May, so actually um, slightly later than the guidance. The original version was published on the 6th of May, but there, there are no significant changes. That was on the ground. Um, so the secretary, this is, um, we'll start, if I may, with the Secretary of State's forward, halfway down 366. It's in pretty clear terms. Um, the severe impact of COVID-19 is described. Um, the Secretary of State then says that millions of people have discovered or rediscovered cycling and walking. And then when the country gets back to work, we need them to carry on cycling and be joined by millions more. Public transport capacity reduced. Roads in our largest city may not be able to cope without it. Uh, and then pedestrians need more space. There's a link between COVID-19 recovery and fitness. And active travel helps people become more resilient. That's why towns and cities in the UK, around the world, are making or proposing radical changes to their roads to accommodate active travel. Um, we recognise this moment. It's a once-in-a-generation opportunity to deliver transformative change. And then over the page at 367, um, second paragraph, the government therefore expects local authorities to make significant changes to their road layout to give more space to cyclists and pedestrians. So it's a very clear steer from the Secretary of State, uh, and that is embodied, um, as is clear at 367, um, in this being statutory guidance under Section 18 of the Traffic Management Act um, issued by the Secretary of State, and it applies to all highway authorities in England, and it's a mandatory relevant consideration. What can he do about it if a local authority is sluggish or stubborn or obstructive? Well, the effect of the guidance under Section 18 is to make this guidance a mandatory relevant consideration. And so if a local authority does not genuinely and conscientiously take it into account, as a last resort, the Secretary of State could bring a claim for judicial review against the local authority, although hopefully it wouldn't come to that. Uh, Some of the language here presupposes taking the opportunity of this crisis to make changes which are carry the implication of more long-term change. Yes, uh, and I think what the Secretary of State is saying and what the guidance indicates is that if people begin to cycle and that there are attractive routes available for them to do so, they're likely to continue to do so after the pandemic, and therefore that will reduce traffic in the longer term, and there will be health benefits for that longer term. Well, I think I understand that. But the, but the point I was trying to make was that insofar as the theme of this temporary crisis may enable a longer-term change, yes. that doesn't originate with TFL. No, it originates with the Secretary of State. Yes. 
I respectfully agree with that. And so the statutory part of the guidance um, at 367 is starts with the heading reallocating road space measures and it's in very clear and directive terms. Local authorities in areas with high levels of public transport use, so London is obviously included in that, should take measures to reallocate road space to people walking and cycling, both to encourage active travel and to enable social distancing during restart. Local authorities uh, where public transport use is low should be considering all possible measures. And then the time scale is set out. Measures should be taken as swiftly as possible and in any event within weeks given the urgent need to change travel habits before the restart takes <coughs> effect. And then the language in the next paragraph is one of a step change uh, in rollout. And it said that none of these measures are new, but uh, they've got to be done a great deal faster. Uh, so some of the measures which are proposed by the Secretary of State in this statutory guidance, um, just to identify the relevant ones at 368, halfway down 368, the bullet point is introducing pedestrian and cycle zones, restricting access for motor vehicles at certain times or all times to streets, networks of streets, town centres and high streets. And then the penultimate bullet point in that list, whole route approaches to create corridors for buses, cycles and access only on key routes into town and city centres. So the network management guidance produced by the Secretary of State is entirely consonant with TfL's implementation of it in its own guidance and ultimately the A10 order to reframe. This um, document doesn't seem to say anything about taxes, does it? No, it doesn't. No. Then that brings me to the final decision, uh, which is which was challenged, which is the A10 order itself. Um, the A10 order is in uh, the core bundle at tab 19. I can take it very quickly. Paragraph 2 of the A10 order, or Article 2 of the A10 order, sets out the reasons for the order so that social distancing measures can be introduced because of the likelihood of danger to the public due to the coronavirus pandemic. So the order sets out on its face why the restrictions are being introduced. Uh, paragraph 3 is the automatic expiry of the restrictions, so 15th of January next year, or whenever the social distancing measures are not required, whichever is the sooner. So uh, we say it's not a sustainable conclusion to say that this was in reality an attempt to introduce permanent change. Um, the order automatically falls when social distancing is no longer required. This, this has therefore a definite time horizon as the regulations require. It does. It has a, uh, the, because this is under emergency powers, it's time limited to a maximum of 18 months. But TfL, in addition to that, uh, introduced a potential expiry which was on an indefinite but earlier date, which is when social distancing was no longer required because it was recognised that this was an emergency measure designed to respond to the pandemic only. And one of the criticisms that can be made of emergency legislation is uh, there is a risk that it becomes permanent by accident. But there is no risk of that in relation to this order. Um, then there is a text description of the restrictions. We don't need to think look at that. And then finally, paragraph four, or article four of the order. Four one, the restrictions only apply during such times and to such extent as is indicated by traffic signs. So the order didn't in practice come into effect until um, 
the sign that has been erected, which was not until August of last year. So the order was made in July, but it didn't, in practice, come into force until later. But this order, on the face of it, um, has, has no mention of gates and no mention of 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., does it? Um, I mean, just reading that, if things had got no further, it would appear that uh, taxis would be entirely excluded for 12 hours a day from the AK. Um, but in fact, that isn't what's happened, as I understood the evidence. No, the, 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 the taxis are only excluded between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. No, the uh, effect of the order is to prevent um, taxis from passing through what are called bus gates. Uh, and there are two of them at each end of Bishop's Gate. And the hours in which taxis and other vehicles are not allowed to pass through uh, is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday. So they can go in overnight <coughs> during the week and at any time mm. during the weekend. That does not, and the order has never prevented taxis from accessing Bishop's Gate via side roads. And so um, we can look at a map if it's easier, but the text of the order um, on page 436, just, just to give an example, uh, in the table on 436 at letter A, which describes one of the bus gates, A10 Bishop's Gate between the junction with Middlesex Street and for a point 11 metres in a southerly direction, so a small sliver of Bishop's Gate is prohibited for vehicles to pass between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday, except for the permitted vehicles, and the permitted vehicles are described as bus, dial-a-ride buses and pedal cycles. Mm. So what you've got is you've got what are called in the transport planning lingo a bus gate, but it's actually um, it's a filter, which um, is a sign and often a partial physical barrier which says that vehicles may not pass at these times unless they're in the permitted categories. Doesn't stop you accessing Bishop's Gate via the side road. It may, of course, be longer and more convoluted to get there. Where have I got 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. from? There's something in the evidence about the, that. Uh, the peak, peak hour. Um, yes. Yeah, so, well, I know, I, know that, I know that's the morning rush hour, but... but there, is, there was some modelling. Yeah. The, the modelling which TfL carried out um, before it made its decision is modelling which focused on the morning peak uh, because that was the time at which the network was most constrained. But that is not the statutory, uh, that's not the effect of the statutory order. And there's, there's an explanation in the decision document as to why those hours were chosen. Uh, and in part, it was to align with similar restrictions that the City of London had already implemented so as to avoid confusion by motorists as to exactly when they could go where in and around the city. Um, but th there's an explanation of that in the decision documents. But the restrictions are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Not to worry. It, it, it must be that modelling. Yes. Uh, you, you, uh, you kindly offered to show us a map. I think it would have got some judicial knowledge of the area outside Liverpool Street Station, but it would be helpful to see that. Yes. J just to finish on the order, um, Article 4. Um, only applies once the signs have been erected and then 4.3 uh, gives TfL the power to introduce exemptions and the evidence in this case was that TfL has granted some exemptions uh, they've granted exemptions to various construction vehicles um, that need access via a main road rather than the side roads uh, and they've also granted access to one disabled person um, who works uh, on Bishopsgate uh, who asked to be able to drive in directly rather than um, access via side roads. Uh, so they have been added to the database on the enforcement cameras. Uh, so the map... Um, so that's that's regis um, registration recognition yeah. um, for that person who uses his or her own vehicle. Um, that wouldn't in any circumstances apply to a taxi carrying that person. No. Um. And that is, that is um, 
the primary and recognised disadvantage of this scheme. That there are going to be situations, and TfL was absolutely aware of this and clear-eyed about it, when this could have implications on access uh, for Bishop's case, including access for people who are disabled. Yeah, that, that seems to be a focal um, feature of the case. The, the, re the, the real disadvantages here are to disabled people with disabilities um, who use taxis regularly and, and have to, to get about, not being able to reach places of work and other destinations in this, in this zone. And so that is something which TfL were well aware of, and it was dealt with at length in the decision documents and also the equality impact assessment. And the reason why TfL ultimately adopted the scheme, uh, and we'll come to the explanations, is first of all, they didn't think it was possible to provide at street access to every part of Bishopsgate under this scheme. And the reason for that is you would have to permit vehicles to do U turns at the bus gate which on a very narrow and constrained road, TfL was concerned, was dangerous. Uh, and secondly, if you allowed taxis in generally, the number of taxis would be such that you would not create a safe and attractive cycle route. And that was the result of their modelling. And so TfL recognised that there were those serious disadvantages to this temporary scheme. But nonetheless, it decided to proceed because it thought that the public health benefits were greater. This is not a case of a public authority that has cheerfully gone into a decision unaware of what the problems were. This is a scheme, like many pandemic measures, that has real and significant disadvantages for some people. That TfL decided that nonetheless the greatest benefit for the greatest number, including vulnerable people, in particular vulnerable people travelling on buses, required that the scheme be introduced. Those are the rather <coughs> difficult and unpleasant judgments that public authorities sometimes have to make and have had to make repeatedly over the last year or so. Mr Jaffe, I'm sorry to be useless, but no, no. I caught your formulation of the second ground on the modelling. Can you um, just repeat the way you put the first reason? You summarised the first reason as being if you admitted via the bus gates, and then a rather... Yes. If, if you admit taxis um, or, or any vehicle via the bus gates, uh, we'll, we'll look at a map in a, in now and you, you'll be able to see it more clearly. Um, but uh, there are two parts of Bishopsgate in which at street access is not possible. Come on, let's look, at, let's look at the map, yeah. Mr. Jaffe, rather than but doing let, it. In let's have page. a look. It's in um, page 395 of the supplemental bundle. Um, th there are very detailed technical drawings later in the bundle, but actually I find them less useful to this overview now. Um, so Bishopsgate runs north to south. Um, for, for much of its length, it's, it's essentially the medieval road layout. It's a single carriageway. Uh, and so there's no room for uh, a dedicated cycle lane, still less a dedicated bus lane. Um, in the wider parts of Bishopsgate, north of Liverpool Street, um, the road is wider, so there is a bus lane there. Uh, and there are some parts in the southern end where there is space for a bus lane as well. But uh, in the central section, there is not. Um, I never thought of it as the A10 before, but that's now. It is technically now the A10. <laughs> yeah. So um, the way the scheme operates is that there are so-called bus gates at the north and south end. They're not physical barriers, but they're essentially no entry except for buses and cycles during the marked times. And other vehicles um, have to take a mandatory left or right turn off Bishop's Gate in order to speed them away without having to do a U-turn. Is there a version of this that's 
even easier to yeah. There, there is, my, my lord. There, actually, there's a there, there's a much better version that was exhibited to the witness statement of uh, Ms. Karen Proctor, KP Forty. Yeah. I did find I did find one much later mm -hmm. on in the bundle. Um, give give us the, the page. I, I'm afraid it's not in the bundle. What I can do, what, what I can do, however, is is have it. I could pass it up. There are there are other maps that yes, that show this it. is this is they're a, rather faint. This this is uh, quite the best map I've come. across. Um, and I could, I could, I could have oh. colour copies made of this. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry that it's not already in the bundle. Yes. It would have been helpful if it had been. No, I no think that one about us. that is, is for Mr. Jaffe. Um, it looks like a. Have you got, a, have you got any copies? Of, have we got? I've seen it before. So thank you. I've got one. I well, I've got, I've got two. One, I'm afraid, is marked. Can I? So I can I hand this up because uh, yes. it's more useful for your lordship to see it than me. Probably. Cool. But can, can we can we take you up on the offer, um, my lord? Tarsi? Yes, and um, the, the marking on this one. If, if you're happy. Oh, I don't mind you marking this. Uh, yeah. um, and here's the third copy. I say this this was before the learned judge exhibited to Ms. Karen Proctor's witness statement. <coughs> I'm very grateful. Please. So have I have I got this right? I mean, just looking at the small. Suppose you're coming up in a in an ordinary car, or for that matter, a taxi. Yes. From the south. Yes. At at what is described as the bus, there will be a sign saying, "If you go any further, you are bound to turn left at Lombard Street." Yes. Um, during those hours. During 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so it feeds you off Bishopsgate? Yes. Onto another road? Right. Now, because of the location of those roads, those side roads, there are two areas, one in the north and one in the south, about 180 metres long each, where during the operating hours you can't get vehicle access except by bus or cycle. Yes. As the orange stripes. So those are those are the areas where at road access, even by side streets, uh, is not possible. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see the reasons for that in the decision document. And, and and that is the effect, the combined effect of the bus gates and existing restrictions on <coughs> on turns. Well, it it's restrict. Some of the restrictions on turns were introduced by this yeah. scheme in order to feed traffic okay, off sorry. without needing to use. So them. I should have said it, it's the combined effect of the bus gates and the combination of existing and now imposed restricted turns. Yes. Restrictions on turns. Yes. Hence, hence the orange um, sections are in the, in the, in the, in the, south, in the more southerly, not coextensive with the distance between the bus gates. That's right. So That's they right. are in the northern section. Because there's no intervening turn opportunity. Exactly. So the, the scheme is constrained by the existence of suitable side roads at which vehicles can be um, can be fed off. Um, the alternative scheme, and this is the alternative that was considered in the documents, is you have a single bus gate. You just have a basically a no entry sign at these hours for these vehicles. But then, if a car or a taxi drives up to it, it will then have to do a U-turn. Okay. Um, on a rather busy and constrained street, and that poses its own difficulties, particularly in what is intended to be an attractive cycle uh, of vehicles, possibly large vehicles, doing a U-turn in constrained space. So th the upshot of the scheme is that you can access most, but not all, of Bishopsgate from side roads, but you can't <coughs> use it as a through route. And there's a section in the north and a section in the south when, during the hours of operation of the scheme, you can't um, drive a vehicle immediately uh, along Bishopsgate. Um, access is maintained to Liverpool Street Station in two ways. Um, first of all, the Liverpool Street Station taxi rank, uh, which remains open and accessible via side roads and Bishopsgate. Um, and there is also, um, as was the evidence before the judge, a second access route to Liverpool Street from the north via Primrose Street, which is a disabled access to Liverpool Street, 
um, to deposit a passenger directly at the platforms. Where's the taxi rank? Uh, the taxi rank is on Liverpool Street itself. Um, oh, so it's on the west side, of, just to the west of Bishopsgate. Uh, and the way in which Liverpool Street operates is uh, Liverpool Street is a, um, uh, it operates as a, a kind of U-shaped road that a taxi drives down it, joins the rank, and then once the taxi has reached the front of the rank, the taxi will have turned around already and can then drive out the way the taxi came. Goes back down Liverpool Street. Goes, then goes back down Liverpool Street and then out onto Bishopsgate. Yep. So that's the scheme. Um, then the three relevant policies Um, in addition to the specific pandemic policies that we've looked at, are the mayor's transport strategy, the bus lane policy, and the cycling quality policy. Um, the overarching policy which is relevant is the mayor's transport strategy, um, which I handed up a more complete copy of this morning. That's in tab 27 of the supplemental bundle. This is again a statutory policy the mayor is obliged to prepare and publish um, after a consultation and approval procedure a transport strategy. Uh, and this is a 2018 document, so a pre-pandemic document. Um, can I just draw the court's attention briefly to the relevant parts? So first of all, page 15, uh, and the relevant bits are highlighted. So buses are London's most heavily used form of public transport, also accessible, but journey times are unpredictable and ridership levels fall falling. Being stuck on a bus in traffic, not knowing how long it will take is frustrating, increasingly common experience. For some, such as older and disabled people, this can be particularly problematic. Oh. Buses may be the only form of public transport. Um, I'm not sure we have to. Uh, We've got the odd number of pages together. Uh, page page 15 ought to be there. Yes. Um, looking at the numbers on the top right. Yeah. Yes. In the, in the pink. Um, in the in the pink section. Band, yes. yeah. Am I right? We've only got the odd number of pages. Uh, what you've got here is you've got an agreed selection of extracts that was oh, before right. the judge. All right. um, so you haven't got all the pages. We've just extracted the bits about buses, taxis, and cycles. Yeah, yeah. Because um, so the whole thing is weighs in at over a couple of hundred pages, I think. So it's page 15 first. Page 15, first of all, uh, about bus delays. Um, and the same point is made on page 31 about buses in inner London, low cost accessible transport reduced car use, and the bus services, the final part of the highlighting, must be properly prioritised. Um, the promotion of cycling, and the mayor's cycling policy is set out at page 49. key bit is the highlighted passage in the middle of page 49, which deals with the promotion of cycling and then the last sentence uh, dealing with strategic cycle routes. Then page 89 <coughs> deals with, in part, taxis and the efficiency of taxi use and car use. So the, the middle passage on page 89 in the highlighting, cars are relatively inefficient, 
cars, taxis and private hire vehicles take up nearly half of the street space, but only 13% of the distance travelled, and that's compared to buses. And the policy proposal in the transport strategy is set out at 161 at the top of the page. Oh, sorry, 159, not 161. My apologies. Um, on the right hand side, under the heading bus priority program, there's an explanation that buses are going to be given greater priority. And the relevant policy is on the bottom right of 159. Central London is where there's the greatest opportunity to improve bus journey time through the deployment of bus priority measures. These will include 24 hour bus lanes and bus and cycle only corridors. So the mayor's pre pandemic policy was for bus and cycle only corridors. This is not a new policy. Yeah. It, it, the, the reference you showed us to taxis on page. 89, was it? That yes. Lumped in with yes. cars, taxis, and PHV take up nearly half of all the street space in central London. Yes. Is there any other reference to taxis in, in this document? Uh, yes, there is. There is um, page 209. Focus. And then there's the box, Policy 20, which summarises the Mayor's policy in relation to taxis. Which is that they should be maintained and given the opportunity to flourish. Yeah, that, that's a London-wide policy yeah. for taxis. It is. The specific policy in relation to central London and bus priority is set out at 159 which is that there will be at least some bus and cycle only corridors. Yeah. So that sits together with the policy for taxis London wide. Yes. And we say they have to be read together. So that's the, the mayor's overarching transport policy. The specific policy relating to taxis and bus priority is the bus lane policy. Um, that's at page 239 of the supplemental bundle. Um, tab 26. Sorry, tab 25. Any bad reference? I have given you bad reference. Yes, I have it. Sorry, it's tab 22. I'll get it right third time. Which is true. <coughs> So this policy deals with bus lanes proper uh, and also other bus priority policies like the Bishopsgate scheme. Uh, the Bishopsgate scheme doesn't really involve a bus lane, strictly analysed. Um, there is a sort of dedicated lane which is available for buses. It, it's more accurately described as a bus priority scheme. Um, paragraph 1 introduces the policy. Taxis being a vital part of London's integrated transport network, fulfilling demands that can't be met by bus, train or tube. So sorry, Mr Jaffe, I didn't catch. What, what's the date of this document? Uh, this document dates from 2007. It's not dated, right. uh, but it's uh, existed in similar form um, since uh, I'm instructed around 2000. But this is the current iteration of the yes. policy. And this is the whole document? This is the whole document. It's quite long-standing but short. And the, and the quote there in paragraph one is from the Mayor's Transport Strategy. Which page is that of the Mayor's Transport Strategy? Well, uh, I don't think that's from the current Mayor's Transport Strategy right. because this is a 2000 policy, 2007 policy which remains in force. It's, it's slightly unclear where the quote comes from. Uh, but, but nonetheless, as a, as a statement of the importance of taxis, it certainly remains yep. the Mayor and TfL's policy. Yeah, so that's current policy. Current policy. And then paragraph two is the, the policy, 
read together with the rest of it, TfL's general policy should be to allow taxis in all bus lanes, except where the specific where specific safety or bus operational issues make this impractical. And the policy applies, paragraph three, for the purposes of taxis driving in bus lanes as through routes and picking up and setting down. Eligible bus existing bus lanes are being reviewed. New bus lanes will be assessed within the context of this policy. And then paragraph five is probably the most relevant provision for this case. The judge focused on paragraph two, but it perhaps doesn't matter. But paragraph five is more directly relevant. Taxi access to other priority measures will be considered case by case, taking account of the impacts on public transport operation and the safety of all road users. The, the concept of the safety of all ro road users may be ambiguous or contentious, I don't know. Well, it, uh, it, is, is it contentious in, in, in this case? Well, it, it, um, sorry, you're, you're no, itching, no. To, itching to respond. No, no, I, I'll, let, I'll let my law finish. And <laughs> well, I was, it's, well I, I, as you may have anticipated, what I'm getting to is the question of whether it's road safety, um, safety on the highway, safety for users of the highway as users of the highway, or whether it's public, as it were, health and safety. Well, uh, in the context of a pandemic, uh, we would say it's impossible to disentangle the two because what is occurring is that people are being exposed to health risks merely, for example, by being on public transport. Was this contentious in the court below, this question? Uh, uh, perhaps we should ask Mr Mathias that. The, uh, no, it wasn't specifically raised as an issue below. My Lord, but it, 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 it would be my, my submission that uh, safety in, in the context of this policy is a reference to road safety, quite, quite plainly. But the, the issue wasn't aired below, specifically. It, it wasn't suggested by my learning friend below that public health was an excluded consideration and that one could only consider road accidents. Um, well, that's what I was getting at. Uh, and my submission as to the proper interpretation of this policy is that that must be right. Um, so paragraph two refers to specific safety or bus operational issues. Uh, those are very wide terms. And this is described in paragraph two as being a general policy. So th the aim is to guide decision making in a sensible and pragmatic way. Uh, and where the use of, for example, public transport um, may itself cause real safety issues through the transmission of infection and where safety issues arise in relation to a proposal for bus priority and cycle priority those are legitimate matters for TfL to consider when applying this policy we suggest I, I, I wonder if I might intervene shortly my lords because um, a learned friend's been referring to this document that we're looking at, at uh, tab 22, as being the policy. Um, with all respect, my friend, it's not the policy. This is the policy guidance. And this was, this was quite clearly appreciated below. Um, the policy itself is set out in the judgment at paragraph 118, the substantive judgment. Um, where it, 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 it's cited by Mr. Justice Burton in the Eventech case, where TfL were engaged in defending the importance of their bus lane policy. Which paragraph? Of the paragraph 118, my lord. It's page 100 in the core bundle. This is the, this document which has never been produced. No, it hasn't. Um, but it, it, we, f we find it being referred to in precisely these terms in this case, in the first witness statement of Mr. Monk. So I think there was no there was no dispute below that this is the policy. The document we're looking at now, tab, tab twenty two, is is the as it says, of course, the policy guidance. The guidance. Yes. Um, referred to by the judge four paragraphs later. Yes. Um, so where, where is the bus lanes policy? It, it hasn't been produced. Save that it is expressly referred to by, by Mr. Monk in his first witness statement. 
Um, and I can give my lords. So, so the answer to my question is that we don't have the document. We don't have a document. No, we don't have the document, but we've got the, um, as I say, those those references to it. Yes, we've never been able to. We, it, it was clearly cited in Eventech. Yes. Uh, but we haven't been able to find it. The only thing that remains on TFL's records uh, is the guidance. And the only surviving record of a separate policy is as quoted by Mr. Justice Burton in Eventech. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure it really makes any difference, to be honest, because looking at paragraph 118 of the judgment, mm. allow for taxis in all bus lanes unless their inclusion would cause significant delay to buses. So that's an additional provision which is not present in the guidance, um, or materially worsen the safety of road users, including pedestrians, and taking account of the effect of safety of excluding taxis from the bus lane. It seems, to say the least, surprising that <coughs> between them, the parties in these proceedings do not have a full copy of the bus lane's policy. And yeah. when, when I say between them, I note what is said at paragraph 8 of the policy guidance. And yes. the Contacts there listed. Yeah. Well, um, there it is. But no one, it, no it, one's it, been able to find it. I'm the, afraid we have the, tried. The policy or the surviving fragment of it, and the policy guidance, don't seem to me to be terribly divergent. No, they're, 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 they all march in the same direction, and um, it remains the case that, um, at the very least, the guidance is what TFL considers to be its policy, and the terms of the policy don't actually seem to be any different in any meaningful sense, uh, and that is what guides decision making. The, the reference, my lords, in Mr Monk's first witness statement, it's in the, the Supplemental Appeal Bundle, tab 16, page 186, and it's at paragraph 25. And, and, and whilst the difference in wording may not be great, it, it will be part of my submission that it is the wording of the policy that is important. I'm very grateful. Just to finish on um, the bus lane policy and the bus lane guidance, um, there were examples before the judge of how it works in practice, uh, and the examples are in the supplemental bundle at tab 32. Um, this is correspondence between um, representatives of taxi drivers and Transport for London um, dealing with specific applications of the policy at particular locations. Um, the taxi drivers were requesting access to various bus lanes that had previously been closed to them, and it's pre-pandemic. And access was granted for some of them. So for example, the first one, Shorter Street near Tower Hill, uh, was granted and it was refused for others. So for example, page 335, halfway down the page, London Road bus lane between Elephant and St George's Circus. And the reasons given is that the junction is operating at maximum capacity. Buses fully utilise the available space. Adding taxi access would cause buses to back up and result in congestion. Therefore, no. So. Those are the types of situations when, before the pandemic, the policy has been applied, um, and where the effect of allowing taxi access is to have an adverse impact on buses. TfL's answer has always been that the bus will ultimately get priority. Where taxis can be accommodated, of course they will be, and usually they can be. Um, the final policy is um, the cycle route quality criteria at tab 30 of the supplemental bundle. This is um, TfL's pre-pandemic policy which applies to new cycle routes. Um, 
and uh, what it does is it sets out criteria for cycle routes, um, including routes such as Bishopsgate, where cyclists are being asked to share space with motor vehicles. Um, and the relevant um, part of the policy is page 320. So the heading is criteria one, about the degree of separation being appropriate for the total volume of two-way motorised traffic. And then two ticks, the design of new cycle routes should only mix people cycling with motor traffic where there are fewer than 500 vehicles per hour two-way at peak times and preferably fewer than 200. And then one tick, the design of the new routes will provide as an absolute minimum a light segregated cycle lane when there are more than a thousand vehicles per hour at peak. So what TfL is trying to do where you can't have a dedicated cycle lane is to limit traffic levels to no more than 500 vehicles per hour at peak times. And again, that's their published policy. So, we then turn to the decision documents in relation to the A10 scheme, and the best statement of the reasons for the A10 order uh, is in the paper that was provided to TfL senior officials requesting a decision on the schemes. Um, that's in the supplemental volume at tab 52, page 485. proposed decision at the top of 485 is to make the A10 order uh, and the, the background section sets out the purpose of the order and it's clearly set out it's to make space for walking to protect bus journey times um, encourage improve cycling conditions encourage cycling and therefore enable social distancing and then the final Which sentence page of this? Uh, sorry, my lord, page 485. Yeah, I've got, got that, but what's the date? 14th of July. 14th of July, 2020. Yeah. Yes. And then the last sentence of the background section again states the public health object. This is to ensure that the likelihood of danger to the public by the transmission of the coronavirus is minimised. Now, when we come to assess the rationality of such a policy, that public health objective, we say, does mean that the scales are not equal in relation to some of the advantages and disadvantages. There may be inconvenience, even serious inconvenience, or the prevention of access for some people at some times in some circumstances. But that may legitimately carry less weight in TfL's analysis, given the importance of what is thought to be achieved by the implementation of the policy. And then under the heading Objectives and Outcomes, the objective is to respond to the public health emergency and support the safe restart of London's economy by introducing a temporary bus walk cycle only corridor. So we say, contrary to the judge's findings, the purpose of the order was to deal with the restart phase when people were returning to the streets. And also that the policy was avowedly temporary. Um, there's then an explanation of the design and the operation of the scheme. Uh, and it's explained in some detail. One of the things that we haven't looked at to date on the map is that pavements 
were being substantially widened along Bishopsgate. Now, if you widen the pavement, the, the necessary consequence of that is that there's less space on the road. So the roads were becoming narrower and more constrained. And there is no challenge to, uh, I think, that decision on behalf of Mr. Mathias's clients. Then at page 486, there's a detailed description of the design of the scheme. So the first large paragraph on 486 explains the bus gates and the new band turns, the hours of operation, which are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday to Friday. And then there is an explanation of how those hours have been selected. Uh, and that's because they align with other restrictions that the City of London has introduced uh, and though, even though the congestion charge is operating until 10 p.m. in central London, including Bishopsgate, it's possible to lift these restrictions earlier at 7 p.m. Uh, for the reasons that are set out. The, the City of London restrictions, are they, um, are they before us, first of all? Uh, no, they're not. There is a summary of them, or some of them, um, annexed to the judgment below. Um, page 150 of the bundle, uh, the core bundle. Uh, and they're summarised in a, in a Scott schedule that the parties prepared of the various other schemes that have been uh, introduced. And uh, the various restrictions as described by um, the claimants, the defendants, and then the claimants' response are then set out uh, in that table. Uh, there was, I think, broad agreement as to the effect of um, the various measures in the City of London. There were some restrictions on taxis in some places at some times. But, so those restrictions were already in place by the time the A10 order came to but were they also responses to the pandemic they were. 2020? So uh, the City of London took its own measures there, uh, and some of those measures included restrictions on access to taxis. Some of them did permit taxis. Uh, and there's, there were a variety of measures taken. And is there a challenge to any of those restrictions, legal challenge? I don't believe so. We don't have the dates of those restrictions, my lords, um, do we? Yes. Uh, although it's clear from the decision document at page 486, halfway through the first big paragraph, where it said these hours are in alignment with the timings introduced by the city on their roads as part of their COVID-19 response, the, it, it's apparent they've already happened. Uh, then in the middle paragraph on 486, there's an explanation of the bus gates. Uh, and then it's expressly noted for the decision makers in the second half of the middle paragraph um, that access is available from side roads for servicing and deliveries and for taxis, private hire and other vehicles, except, and the exception is noted, for two lengths of the corridor, which are explained further below. And then the final paragraph on 486 sets out in detail those two areas where access will not be available directly during the operation of the scheme, except by bus and cycle. And the reason for that is set out right at the bottom of 486, which is that it's not possible to uh, allow access to all areas because there are no side streets where people can turn off. Uh, and therefore you're going to have people doing U-turns on the confined part of Bishopsgate, which is unacceptable. Is, is this stretch of Bishopsgate 
single lane or two lane? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that immediately. Can I check? Single lane. Single lane. Single lane. Yes. Yeah. So it'd be U turns across single lane carriage. It's a single lane carriageway, which will be um, uh, the preferred strategic cycling route. Uh, and so the risk to cyclists is one which is particularly identified at the bottom of 486 uh, and the top of 487. Then at the top of 487, there's the effect of the scheme, the temporary restrictions, again, they're temporary to reduce traffic through traffic, allow us to widen footways for pedestrians, improve bus journey times and conditions for cyclists in the corridor. Um, they're going to widen footways. Uh, the widen footways will need to be in place 24 hours a day, obviously, because once you've built them, they're there. Uh, and then cyclists will be on carriageway, but with the reduction in through traffic, we expect flows to be within the quality criteria for such an arrangement although this is subject to further analysis. So those are the cycling quality standards that we just looked at in the policy. They're going to get it down to below 500 vehicles per hour at peak times. And it's also anticipated the reduction in traffic will lead to bus journey time benefits as over con overall congestion is reduced. So that's the analysis of the scheme. And again, um, the disadvantages of the scheme are, are clearly, and we say fairly, presented to the decision makers. Everybody knows what the problems are, but everyone is also identifying what the potential advantages are of the scheme. Um, then the London Taxi Drivers Association's objections are dealt with at the top of page 488. That letter of objection was annexed to this paper, so the decision makers had it uh, before them, and it's at page 498 uh, of the bundle. So I could just invite the court to have a quick look at that. Um, so there's a cover letter from Mr. McNamara, the General Secretary of the Association at 498. Um, they're not happy. Um, the, the key point is in the second paragraph. We understand the need for measures to support active travel and social distancing. If implemented without full taxi access, the same access as buses, the scheme will disadvantage those who rely on black cabs to get around, including disabled and vulnerable passengers, undermine the service cabs provide, and devastate the taxi trade. Uh, and then in the middle of the page, um, there's a reference to the privileged access that taxis have. This scheme and others being developed are gradually undermining the reliable service black cabs provide. Taxis' privileged access and ability, and then there's a quote, to go where buses go, reflect the important role they play in London, not only as the only 100% accessible form of public transport. And it would be bad to remove that. Now, it's not obvious where the quote comes from, to go where buses go. But that's certainly no part of any of TfL's policy. TfL does not have a policy that taxis can go where buses go. Access is granted under the bus lane policy where access does not affect bus journey times or safety. But where there is a constraint on capacity or a safety concern, buses may get priority. Was this the original um, letter of complaint for Miss say a very early um, letter in the sequence leading to litigation? It, it, um, what, what, was there any corresponding letter about the guidance, or, or does the attack start with the A10 order and then broaden out? 
the, the attack starts with the proposals that led to the A10 order. Yes. yes. Um, and before this letter of the 8th of July, uh, in the days before that, there were two meetings with the LTDA and other taxi driver representatives at which this scheme was discussed in detail. Um, you have the minutes of those meetings in the bundle, but I don't I need to go through them because it's, it's the same as this letter, the concerns that were expressed. This letter is the culmination of those meetings where yeah. the concerns are expressed, and they're being expressed formally here. Um, and then the detailed comments on the proposal are set out at 499 and 500. Uh, the points made are those that perhaps would be expected to be made. Um, passenger safety and choice is the first heading. And then the second heading is taxis should be able to go where buses go. The plans are designed to speed up bus times, but licensed taxis have the right to use bus lanes and the same, same access as buses without any detrimental impact on bus journey time. We say that's an incorrect statement of the bus lane policy. Sorry, you're reading from where? Sorry, at page 499, yeah. the heading taxi should be able to go where buses go. And then the first paragraph after that is the submission by the LTDA. Um, I, th I think it, it, it is intended to read not as a qualification, that last part of that sentence, but as a statement of fact. Yes, it's a statement of fact that, that taxis manage to go in most bus lanes without affecting bus journey time, so why can't they here, is I think the point that's being yes, made. Yes, it's, it's, it's not as if it's um, a proviso. No, no. I don't think it's being recognised by the LTDA as a proviso. But, but we say that under the bus lane policy, that clearly is properly to be recognised as a proviso that where it would have detrimental effects on bus journey times, the bus lane policy does not require taxi access to be the same as buses. Those are the operational reasons which are spoken of in the policy, even ignoring the safety issue. There's reference to the Mayor's 2016 Taxi and PHB Action Plan. Yes, the Action Plan. Uh, is at tab 25 of the supplemental bundle. And what that document says about bus lanes is at page 252, paragraph 13. Paragraph 13 refers to the continued use of bus lanes, a right which we previously defended successfully in court, and that's defence against requests by private hire vehicles to use bus lanes as well to support quick and convenient journeys by black cab, as well as enabling access to additional bus lanes that taxis have previously not been allowed to enter. And then there are two examples, allowing access by taxis to 20 additional bus lanes on the TFL roads by the end of 2016, and writing to the boroughs to ask them to consider a further 40 bus lanes on their roads. Uh, and then there's a schedule on page 255 setting out various locations where TFL has granted additional access to its bus lane. Again, it's not suggested that that changes or undermines the bus lane policy. Not every bus lane has ever been open to taxis and not every bus, lane, bus priority measure has been open to taxis. Most of them are, but not all of them. Um, then, just to finish up on the decision document at page 488, um, the top of 488 refers to the LTDA letter we just looked at. It's 
it's noted there's no statutory consultation required, but the LTDA's concerns have been taken into account. And then there's the reasoning of officials as to why they invite the senior officials to make the order. PFL recognise there are some potential negative impacts around the increased time and distance and associated cost for journeys. And then the public health imperative <coughs> is noted and the benefits of encouraging walking and cycling and protecting limited public transport capacity. And then express consideration of accessibility by taxi. PFL recognises the taxi trade plays a role in providing access for some people with mobility issues. The design of the scheme balances, carefully balances, the need to reduce overall levels of motor traffic, <coughs> allow the reallocation of space, and through the use of bus gates and banned turns, allows access by taxis and others to the maximum number of properties. Access to Liverpool Street Station is maintained, and then there's commentary on the hours of operation being consistent with the city uh, arrangements. And then the conclusion is buses are mass transit vehicles, and they're the predominant road transport choice for commuters, hence why they are being granted access. With <coughs> overall levels of general traffic on the corridor low and access maintained to the majority of the corridor, it's expected that reassignment onto alternative routes will be minimal, and this will be monitored. Um, then at page 489, there's a reference to the equality impact assessment. Um, we'll come back to that when I deal with the judge's findings on that. Uh, but again, the paper for the decision makers in the second paragraph under equality impact assessment um, acknowledges there will be some negative impacts on members of the public with certain protected characteristics. And then those are set out. The conclusion is that the last sentence, the public health imperatives warrant continuing with the scheme as designed. So well, that's the decision. We say there was a careful analysis of the taxi driver's objections. Um, there is a frank recognition that some of those objections have some merit. There are legitimate points that can be made uh, against this scheme, and I don't speak to suggest otherwise. But the view of TfL was that the advantages of the scheme, as mitigated by the various features that are described, means that making the scheme has more merit than not making it, because of the public health imperatives of reducing transmission by reducing bus journey times, promoting walking and cycling, and reducing the use of buses to enable social distancing for those people that do need to travel by bus. And we do say, is this decision one which involves a departure from TfL and the mayor's policies, either pandemic policies or pre-pandemic policies? We suggest not. The safety reasons and the operational reasons why taxis are not being allowed through the bus gate during the peak hours are set out in this paper. Um, the statutory procedure for making an emergency order doesn't require, unlike, for example, a planning decision, uh, a decision with reasons. Uh, but nonetheless, after the order was made, um, TfL wrote to LTDA to inform them of its decision and to set out the reasons for it and why their representations had not been accepted. Um, that letter is at tab 59 of the supplemental bundle. Um, the judge said that um, no real attention should be paid to this letter because it postdated uh, the formal decision. Uh, but it's TfL's formal response to the taxi driver's objections. And the letter was sent before the scheme came into force and whilst it was being built, uh, explaining TfL's response to the 
detailed representations that the LTDA has made. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, it reflects the reasoning set out in the decision paper we've just looked at. Um, the language is all very familiar. It repeats the explanation of the purpose of the scheme, reduction of transmission. Uh, at the bottom of page 538, it's confirmed this is a temporary change to the highway network. And then 539, same language as in the uh, decision paper at the top of 539, reduce road space, congestion and pollution will increase danger to pedestrians and cyclists. We need to achieve significantly reduced vehicle traffic. We've assessed to include reducing public transportation other than mass transit vehicles such as buses. So same language. And then the next paragraph recognises the importance of taxis in London, um, but the scheme is primarily driven by public safety during the COVID-19 period, and the benefits outweigh the likely adverse effects. And there is a promise to monitor the effects of the scheme. Um, then, at the bottom of 539, the taxis should be able to go where buses go argument is dealt with. Um, so the first point is that Bishop's Gate remains open for taxis for access. The bus gates restrict through traffic in order to achieve a reasonable reduction in overall traffic levels to make the roads safer and more attractive for cyclists to travel alongside buses during the busiest daytime period. And that, that's going to be monitored. There's an assurance at the bottom of 539 that TfL remains committed to ensuring that taxis can access the vast majority of bus lanes. And then some figures are given. And then the concluding sentence, the decision not to permit access in some locations is driven by clear safety or operational reasons, which apply in the case of the temporary bus gates on this route. So it's the language of the bus lane policy. Um, I said there was some modelling which took place uh, and can I just give the court um, the references to that modelling because these decision documents and decision proposal documents didn't appear out of nowhere um, the judge's finding was ultimately that it was um, irrational for TfL not to wait and do more research and analysis before making this order um, and so the reason I show the court these documents of the modelling, albeit briefly, is to demonstrate that the consequences of these schemes were carefully considered at the time. Um, before the pandemic happened, there had already been lots of work done on Bishopsgate because it had long been a concern of TfLs uh, because there, were, there was a long history of bus delays and congestion. And, um, a lengthy history of a high level of cycling accidents. Um, I don't need to take you to that, but the judge cites all that evidence in the judgment at paragraphs 54 to 55. Um, the judge also confirms, and this is in the background facts section, um, that um, my lord, the senior president, noted to me wasn't really controversial, which it isn't, is that Bishop's Gate is a very important bus route. Um, there are 340 buses an hour which use Bishop's Gate at peak times. Is that take um, northbound, southbound? Both directions. Both sides. In, in all? So. In all, in total. Now, that, that's an important number because the limit, as we've seen in TfL's policy for a cycle route, which is shared and not segregated with motor vehicles, is 500 vehicles per hour from the cycling quality standard in both directions. There are already 340 buses an hour at peak times. And the concern that was expressed, and we'll see this in the documents as a result of the modelling, is that you've already got 340 buses an hour at peak times. You add in the necessary and essential traffic, which will still be using Bishop's Gate via side streets, because access will continue to be available via side streets. But once you've done that, there's very little, if any, headroom 
to say that you can continue to permit Bishopsgate as a through route at peak times by any category of vehicle, let alone taxis. The upshot of the modelling, and we'll see this in the documents, is that if you're going to achieve a cycle route, a new cycle route, which achieves, which meets TFL standards, then it's going to be very difficult to allow other vehicles, apart from buses, to continue to use it as a through route. And um, paragraph 55 uh, of the judgment, the judge notes that TFL's evidence was that prior to the pandemic, 43% um, the vehicles other than buses using Bishopsgate were taxis. So a very high proportion of traffic levels on Bishopsgate were buses. So the development of this scheme um, is um, can be seen most quickly by looking at the presentations that were made to two large meetings at TFL, remote meetings, on the 11th of June of 2020, which led up to the decision by officers to recommend this scheme and led to the decision document that it was produced. Um, so the records of those meetings start in the supplemental bundle at tab 40. And there were two presentations that day. First of all, there was one specifically relating to Bishopsgate, which is what we'll look at first. And then secondly, there was one relating to taxi access. Did you say 4-0? Uh, yes, tab 40, 4-0. Four um, and my lord should have page 391, a presentation. Yep. So the objectives are set out at 392 in familiar form. Then 393, the second bullet point, it was noted that taxi access discussions as part of the wider central London area continue. Um, TfL was well aware that the taxi access issues were controversial and important, uh, and they hadn't been decided at that point. And then there was a preferred option, which was presented at 394, uh, and that's the option that was ultimately um, implemented. And at 396, the preferred option is based around bus gates and band turns, with no taxis permitted through the bus gates, restricts the through traffic but maintains access for servicing and taxi set down and pick up, but two sections where no motorised vehicles except buses are permitted, and then the reasons for that, the U-turn issue. Then page 402 is the analysis of the consequences for cycling, that if the preferred option is implemented, the flows would be within 500 vehicles per hour two-way upper limit for cyclists set out in the quality criteria. So that's why they were doing it. And then the other presentation is at tab 41, the next tab. And this second presentation of the same date deals specifically with the position of taxis and taxi access. Uh, it's an important document because it's rather suggested uh, by the respondents that the interests of taxis were somehow ignored. Um, far from being ignored, access for taxis was specifically considered and subject to the computer modelling, the results of which are set out in this presentation. So the heading of the presentation on page 411 is the challenge of balancing social distancing measures with essential traffic and taxi and private hire services. So TfL were well aware of the dilemmas which were involved in all of its central London schemes of balancing social distancing, essential traffic and taxi access. Then page 412 there is an explanation of those dilemmas. And in particular, I draw the court's <coughs> attention to the fourth bullet point. Taxi, private hire and private cars enable mobility for those unable to use active modes, for example walking or cycling, or public transport. So 
again, TfL was well aware of the importance of um, taxis for access purposes, particularly for those who are unable to walk, cycle, or use public transport. That was the point of the analysis in this presentation. And then page 413 is the problems. Taxi and private hire context need to restrict traffic in order to achieve social distancing and cycling objectives. Taxis make up a very high proportion of the flow on some routes, including Bishopsgate, and the modelling suggests that if taxis aren't restricted, they may take up any road space created by restricting other traffic. So that is the problem which is being identified of what TfL call capacity infilling. If you create a nice quiet route that everyone is excluded from except for buses and taxis, um, taxis will use that route in preference to an alternative. Um, so it's not simply the problem of having too many taxis to achieve a reasonable cycle route. That once you permit taxis, you actually attract new taxi traffic that would otherwise have taken a different route. Now, why does that happen? Well, it happens because taxi drivers are the most sophisticated users of London's transport network. They have the knowledge. They have an unrivaled understanding of traffic flows uh, around London, and they will take um, the quickest route. And so if there is a route that is available to them, but not to other vehicles, then that's a route they may use in priority. Um, so then there is uh, some extensive modelling which takes place um, and the modelling covers all three of the 15th of May proposals so there was the proposal in the west of um, Waterloo to Euston um, the proposal in the centre of the city along Farringdon Road and then the proposal in the east the Bishopsgate and London Bridge schemes um, so looking at page um, 418, uh, there's an explanation of what was done. Um, what was modelled was the effect of these schemes on journeys to and from the key mainline stations and how they would be affected by each of the three proposals. Um, and then I'm not going to go through the modelling and the results of it, but it's very detailed. And the upshot is at page 438, which sets out the conclusions in text form. So the summary is most of the network remains porous and in the vast majority of cases accessible to taxi and private hire vehicles and other essential traffic. And then the but is in the third bullet point down. The analysis indicates the importance to maintain a strong north-south route through central London for vehicles. This means that proposed street space plans to restrict traffic on Waterloo Bridge and Farringdon Road should be reconsidered. So the results of the modelling were that if the Mayor's initial proposals on the 15th of May for the scheme in the west, Waterloo Bridge, Euston and Farringdon Road in the centre of the city were introduced, there would be serious problems for taxi and private hire services and essential traffic. And that is the point at which those schemes were not pursued. Did the modelling take account of the City of London restrictions? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know the immediate answer to that, but um, the ex my expectation, without any knowledge, is that um, it will have done. Uh, but certainly it was not criticised below on the basis that it failed to do so. The schemes as implemented, the, the Bishopsgate scheme was implemented, uh, but the London Bridge part of it, so the south of Bishopsgate, did allow taxis and still does allow taxis. So as a result of the modelling of the potential effect of these proposals on taxis, um, most of them were not proceeded with. Who, now, who got these documents, 40 and 41? Were they um, TFL internal? They're TFL internal documents. 
the, these are these are the presentations that were before TfL when um, they were making decisions at the at the, at the officer level rather than the final decision maker level. Um, then there are the minutes of the meeting at which the initial decisions are taken, uh, and those are at tab 39. And I do apologise again. I, I appreciate this is quite a painful and long exercise in the Court of Appeal, but it's because it's a rationality challenge, I'm afraid. 39. Uh, <coughs> sorry, my lord, yes, 39. So this is, again, the 11th of June. So we've got two presentations we've looked at, made by officers. Big meeting, lots of people at which they're discussed. Uh, and these are the minutes of the meeting. Um, and the key point, if, if I can pick up page 387, um, towards the top of the page, paragraph 8, under the heading commentary on the right hand side. And it was shared in the meeting that flows are expected to be within 500 vehicles per hour two-way, which is the upper limit for cyclists to mix with motorised traffic, set out in the quality criteria. So what was being confirmed is that this scheme as designed would get that traffic level down to what was thought to be an acceptable level. And then at 388, at the bottom of the page, on the right-hand side, um, Mr. Marshall uh, confirmed and explained the two sections where there wouldn't be access to motorised vehicles except buses. And then at the top of 389, the consequences of that are set out that you might have to continue on the pavement a maximum of 80 metres. So that was the accessibility difficulty. Um, and then 389. Box four in the commentary deals with continued access to Liverpool Street taxi rank, and then at the bottom of the page, um, uh, the U-turn issue. And then 390, um, decision two, summary of decisions agreed on the 11th of June. Um, that the designs were approved as presented to the group. And then the reasons for that are explained, the urgent nature of the requirement to deliver COVID recovery measures, uh, and important role in prioritising road space. And then there's a note at the bottom of the page, these proposals are not commensurate with an ambition to create an entirely traffic-free corridor, but represent a pragmatic and fair compromise in permitting taxi and freight access to local premises while permitting through traffic. So again, there was a clear understanding of the compromises that were being struck. Now, these decisions were taken because it was TfL's prediction that as London reopened, Without schemes such as this, bus journey times and therefore the risk of infection exposure would um, go up and traffic would rapidly increase. Um, as it happens, um, TfL's predictions were correct. That is exactly what happened. Um, the judge gives the figures um, in her judgment in the facts section. Um, I won't take the court through it. They're at paragraph um, 29 of the judgment. But the upshot is that by October of 2020, traffic on the TfL roads, that is the major strategic roads controlled by TfL, including Bishopsgate, was back up to 90% of its pre-pandemic levels. And in central London, all of central London, including minor roads in central London, traffic was up to 79% of its usual levels. So, Jackie, when you say traffic has gone up, that means the number of vehicles as opposed to the number of transfers of people. Yes. So uh, what TfL is concerned with is obviously the number of vehicles because that's what causes congestion. Because of its relationship with the capacity of buses which have to be reduced. Indeed. Yes. The first figure you gave us was 90% and that, that is for which roads? Can I, can I show the court of it in paragraph 29 of the judgment because then you, you can see it best. 
rather than be going to the source materials. The ninety percent strategic roads. So seventy-eight percent looking at roads as a whole. Yeah. Sorry, strategic meaning TFL roads. Yes, TFL roads. Yeah. The, or the TLRN, the Transport for London Route Network, as it's officially called. Yeah. Uh, and that's dealt with twenty-nine to thirty-one, where the judge sets out those figures um, at the Roman numerals. That by October. Uh, and this is uh, paragraph 31, Roman 3. Central London traffic counts were 79% of normal demand. And traffic on all types on the main strategic route throughout Greater London was 91% of normal demand. Uh, and what the judge calls the main strategic routes, uh, the evidence is that those were the transport for London roads. Which would include... Obviously, included Bishop's Gate. Bishop's Gate. Bishop's Gate. That's that's um, that's clearly an average across the whole T L R N. Yes. Some will be nearer to hundred percent. Some will be lower. <coughs> of course, that's a that's an average. But yeah. in terms of whether TFL's prediction that traffic on the road network, and in particular on their strategic routes, would rapidly recover once lockdown was eased. That's a prediction which we say was rational, uh, not least because it turned out to be um, correct. Um, TfL also predicted, on the basis of uh, its analysis, that the effect of this scheme on Bishopsgate would be to keep down bus journey time very substantial. And that prediction was also, as it turned out, uh, correct. Um, the evidence for that is at tab 65 of the supplemental bundle. It might be said to be a mixed causation, mightn't it? Because if you only have a third of the normal load of passengers, they take less time getting on and getting off. So you would expect other things being equal and the bus to move along quite a lot quicker. Um, you have to be very careful to note that potential confounding effect, but the evidence which TfL put before the judge was that the introduction of the scheme led to a substantial reduction in bus journey times, and that wasn't caused by a change in capacity. Actually, bus, whilst bus usage was increasing, Actually, on the moment of introduction of the scheme, there was a rapid drop in bus journey times. Uh, and that's what the evidence before the judge showed, uh, as TfL predicted it would be. Um, so it's tab 65 of the supplemental bundle. Uh, and the results are on the graph on page 575. So these are the bus journey times measured in minutes per kilometre. So how many minutes does it take to go a kilometre along Bishop's Gate? Uh, Pre-pandemic, one can see that it varied between, roughly speaking, five and seven minutes per kilometre. When the lockdown measures were introduced in March, there was a rapid drop uh, in bus journey times to three minutes per kilometre. Far fewer people using the buses, far fewer people on the roads. Then as lockdown eased, but before the scheme was implemented, bus journey time started to increase. So up to about four minutes and heading upwards from there to almost towards five minutes a kilometre during the construction of the scheme. And then the final line on the right hand side of the page is the implementation of the scheme and the bus journey times immediately drop back down to the lockdown speed of about three minutes per kilometre. So TfL's view is that the scheme has in fact uh, achieved its primary objective of keeping bus journey times short and therefore for those people that need to use buses they're not sitting on them for longer than necessary being exposed to the risk of infection. Sorry, you said the policy, you mean the order? Yes, the order. Yeah. 
Bear my look. Just before the short adjournment, and I'll, I'll turn straight after the short adjournment to the judge's decision. Hmm. But before looking at the detail of the judge's analysis, it's perhaps worth just stepping back for a moment. We suggest that in light of those materials, it's not immediately obvious whether the fundamental error that requires the quashing of the entirety of the plan, the guidance, and the A10 order lies. And the mayor's transport strategy encourages the creation of bus and cycle only corridors. Um, the quality standards set out the policy on the levels of traffic that are acceptable on those kind of corridors, like Bishopsgate. The bus lane policy doesn't prevent such schemes where appropriate for safety or operational purposes. Are there safety issues here and operational issues? Well, we submit there clearly are, for the reasons I've already sought to identify. Maximising the ability to socially distance on buses, minimising congestion and providing safe and attractive cycle routes are likely to reduce the transmission of disease and therefore reduce illness and death, in particular amongst the most vulnerable groups. And there's nothing in the bus lane policy that constrains such a scheme. And there were serious problems for TfL. You can't remove the buses. There's 21 bus routes on Bishopsgate, 340 buses an hour at peak times, and you need to keep all of those buses running. Why do you need to keep all of them running? Because the capacity of each bus has been reduced to one third of its normal level. So you've only got headroom for a small number of additional vehicles per hour in each direction. You certainly need to keep access via the side streets for essential deliveries wherever possible. That's going to create traffic on Bishopsgate. Once you've allowed for that, there simply wasn't the capacity for allowing taxis or other vehicles on that route. And at the same time, you want to widen the very busy pavements, particularly outside a mainline rail station, in order to enable social distancing there. The judgment which TfL made is that buses were mass public transport and that cycling and walking needed to be promoted. And where there was a trade-off which had to be made between the different interests of different road users in the context of this emergency, priority needed to be given to achieving the safety objectives um, of the scheme. Now, it's not a perfect scheme. It has real disadvantages. It increases some taxi journey times. It increases some taxi fares. And uh, it is a significant problem that there are some areas of Bishopsgate that you won't be able to directly access by vehicles during peak hours. You may have to travel on the pavement up to 85 or 90 metres. That may mean that there are some journeys, hopefully a small number of journeys, during peak hours which can't be made. But if the objectives of this scheme were going to be achieved without the serious safety risks of allowing people to U-turn or encouraging people to U-turn on Bishop's Gate, there wasn't any obviously better option. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, when TfL talks about the risk of a car-based recovery, the, the alternative is one of a tragedy of the commons. And the problem is that if you permit everyone to resort to cars or taxis or private hire vehicles to get around, it causes the congestion that leaves a bus sitting in traffic. It therefore exposes those people on buses who frankly, are often the more vulnerable people to a higher risk of infection. And you're making an unattractive environment for walking and cycling, which is more polluted, and your policy aims are less likely to be successful. So we say this scheme is properly to be understood as one which, in a very difficult situation, TfL is trying to achieve the greatest benefit for the greatest number, with a clear-eyed appreciation that it's very far from perfect in a pandemic. Uh, and that is the context in which we say that the judge's decision ought properly to be analysed. Um, I'm sorry, right. I've been slightly uh, over one yes, o'clock. Yes, yes. Not to worry. Um, now, Mr Chaffee, how, how, how long do you think you'll need this afternoon? Um, I, I'm expecting uh, dealing with the judge's judgment probably be a little over an hour. A little over an hour. 
so you should be able to. I hope hand on the baton. To yes, I hope the hand on the baton. Is right, if that's convenient. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, five past two. All right.